Okay, here we go. So part one of graphic design history. We're gonna start at the beginning, which would have been the Victorian era. This began in England and continued in England and America and much of Europe um, until 1900. And it was the aesthetic response to industrialization. So this is at, you know, the, we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, um, 1907 advertisement in the Industrial Revolution Europe. Um, in 1845, the high-speed steam press had increased the volume of advertisements that were being restri restricted to special areas only in the city. So. Um, there were, what happened is we had, um, all of a sudden we had a speedy steam press. They could produce more and more of these advertisements. They were pasting them all over the city on every surface they could get their hands on. And more and more communities were saying, Hey, we don't want advertising everywhere we go. So then they were only allowed to paste them in specific areas. However, the overwhelming demand of advertising became a fact of life everywhere. And by the 1860s, it had risen to a profession. Academically trained craftsmen and artists were learning and, and being educated in commercial art. Here's an example of an advertisement for an undervest. 19, 1888, designer unknown. So you can see these illustrations are highly detailed. This is um, basically like little paintings and drawings like you would see um, like something you would hang on a wall. These are, are very elaborate, very detailed, very much the opposite of simplicity. And a reaction to this manufacturing and mass production of the 1850s um, came the arts and crafts movement, which is a romantic vi version or vision of medieval times you know they were done with the starkness of mass production everything being the same didn't have the craftsmanship i mean the, the days were gone of of carved dining room tables they were making them in mass um, william morris an architect and designer whose passion fueled the arts and crafts movement and whose philosophy established the ethics of modern industrial design he dedicated his life to fighting ugliness in all its forms, believing that a society unable to produce good design had at its core a faulty ethical system. Here's some examples of design in the arts and crafts movement. So you can see the influence here of medieval times, right? You can see that it has a the look of an illuminated manuscript with all of the decorative illustration and the borders, the single column design. There's a lot of swirls and twirls and filigree and it's all very elaborate. Here's another publication by Walter Crane, 1893. Um, the Art Workers Guild. So this was the, um, all of the information that if you were in the Art Workers Guild, which would have been like the um, professional association for art workers um, and, and a directory of how to get a hold of the artisans and craftsmen so that when you wanted to rage against the machine, these are the people you would go to and they would do beautiful fine art type productions for you. After arts and crafts, we move into the Art Nouveau movement. It's the 1880s to the out the outset of uh, or the onset of World War One. Art Nouveau was a rebellion against the entire Victorian sensibility, steeped as it was in the past. For a relatively short time, Art Nouveau was so, a one as one critic wrote one of the most imaginative innovations in the history of design. Despite its name, it was born in England. It was a direct descendant of the arts and crafts movement. Here's examples of ornaments and silhouettes. 
can see I used this in our demo last class. You can see the change, how we're getting a little bit more experimental. You can see the introduction of simple um, shapes and we can start to see things getting uh, simpler and simpler, less detailed, less decoration, less adornment. Now we're moving into the period called early modern. By the close of the 19th century, industry is a fact of life. As a rule, manufacturers and retailers were not interested in achieving superior designing, printing for their advertising. So there was, in other words, subpar printing and design happening at this point. Graphic design flourished in a few places though. France, from the mid 1870s to the 1890s, posters promoting cabarets, theaters, circuses, music halls, and other cultural events were happening. Here's some examples. Joseph Hoffman and Coloman Moser earned enough recognition to share their ideas with the new generation of artists. And you can see they were not only designing um, very simplistic illustrations, you know, really pushing sim um, simplicity and simplification. They were also designing typefaces and exploring really stylized layouts. A lot of asymmetry here. They've gone away with that single um, symmetrical design. Moving on to modernism, or modern, sorry, modern, which modern design is including a few different things. We have futurism, vorticism, constructivism, distill, and Bauhaus. We're going to go through each one of these a little bit. As, per as pervasive as their influence is today, modernist art and design were, from the outset, never completely accepted by the majority. The modernist era was roughly between 1908 and 1933 when Hitler came into power. The futurist, futurism we'll start with, the first kind of off cropping here was applied only to Italians and Russians. The entire modernist spirit was a forward-looking and decidedly, decidedly utopian ethic the most emblematic typeface of the age, after all's name was Futura. Here's some examples of uh, 1932, the metal book cover for the book, which is the one on the far left by Tullio Dill and Belosa. Belosa? Well, I'm not sure. I'm gonna excuse my um, Italian. I don't think I have uh, the right pronunciation. And then we have 1912 book covers, um, all typographic in nature. And notice the angles and the kind of illustrative style. Um, the one on the far right looks like a plane, right? Definitely creating an image through the type. Continuing in futurism, Fortunato Di Pero was tirelessly in his propaganda, propagation of futurist principles. He promoted the futurist book, funded and founded and directed the machine art magazine Dynamo, produced futurist radio programs, designed costumes and furniture, and many, many more examples. Um, here's an example of an ad he created for Campari cordials. Vorticism was named by Ezra Pound in 1914 from the vortex, the center of from the vortex, which is the center of all energy, was one of Britain's most avant-garde movements. E. McKnight Kofner's poster for the Daily Herald uh, is on the right here for 1919, and we're looking at this this flock of birds that just gets into this very very simplified and abstracted form. 
And I want you to remember this flock of birds because I'm going to show you another artist that's much more contemporary. This is again, 1919. And um, I'm going to show you another artist that's going to remind you of this, I think, as we go on. Okay, we move into con constructivism. Before constructivism, there were several Russian pre-revolutionary artistic experiments. Constructivism became an early Soviet youth movement, an artistic outlet that aimed to encompass the whole spiritual, cognitive, material activity of man. Here's an example from 1920. Here's an advertisement for watches in 1923. And here's an, a poster advertising the Leningrad Publishing House in 1925. Nineteen twenty-five as well. This is a book cover of a book of poems. Moving on to the Distill Movement, nineteen seventeen to nineteen thirty-one. Distill means the style. It was defined by architect H. P. Burleg as a unity in plurality. Distill was about developing a utopian style and spirit. It was not nearly about the stylization of things. It's based its design on the rectangle and the use of black, white, gray, and the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Here's the example in color by Laszlo Maholinagi and Theo von Duisburg. Here's a couple smaller typographic examples by Piet Zwart and Vilamos Hazar. Walter Gropius created the Bauhaus School in Germany in 1919. The Bauhaus was influenced by Expressionism, Dada, Constructivism, and De Stille. Here's typeface, the Bauhaus typeface that Herbert Beyer designed. Can anyone tell me what brand uses the letter D from this typeface? Is it like Dyson? Nope, not Dyson, but that's a good guess. Oh, not D, sorry. Letter B, I'm sorry, I'm saying D, I'm, yeah. I'm saying D. As, the uh, letter B. Beats? Yeah, beats, yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to say D, I meant to say B. I was wondering I don't if you know meant like Dre. <laughs> I was like, oh. No, I, right, exactly. I think I was having that moment. But yeah, B is beats. So beats uses the, um... and you know what? I'm going to need to look at the Dyson because I think the Dyson might be similar, very similar. I don't think that's completely, that might not be completely off either. I should double check before I say no on that. I don't have it in front of me, but I know for sure Beats is uh, the B. So, but you know what? Now that you've said Dyson, I'm like, you know what? If I have to look at it, I, I can't remember what the Dyson logo looks like. The ABC looks like the ABC channel logo that I grew up with. I don't know if yes. you, people remember that. Yeah, it definitely does. And it, it's definitely um, similar. I think the the ABC logo from the st TV station or the network it might be closer to Futura, but it could be closer to this as well. It might be a combination of Futura and and um, Bauhaus. <coughs> yeah, there's a lot of history in these. All right, so now we have um, Kandinsky's. 60th birthday poster here, um, who is also part of the Bauhaus, but this was designed by Herbert Bay Bayer. It's, uh, so Kandinsky didn't design this, Kandinsky was part of the Bauhaus, but Herbert Bayer uh, designed this for his birthday. Okay, so we're gonna uh, um, get to the end of what we're gonna talk about here, and this is bringing us into modernism. And I'm kind of 
jumping ahead because I want to make a connection for you. We're going to, you're going to see what we'll kind of ebb and flow back and, and forth through the history as we talk about different subjects. So modernism is a phil philosophical, religious and art movement that arose from broad transformations in Western society during the late 19th and early 20th century. So I've just kind of skipped a century. And the reason I did that is I want to show you, we, we, we stopped here in the Bauhaus, which is 1919, okay? So this is the beginning um, of the, of the uh, 20th century, right? And I'm moving over here to modernism, um, late 19th and 20th century, early 20th century. And Charlie Harper is who I'm gonna introduce, 1922, and he died in the end, 2007. Charlie Harper, this was happening at this similar time right after um, after the Bauhaus. But Charlie Harper's unique, he's an American and his unique minimalist approach is unmistakable from his groundbreaking mid-century illustrations for Ford Times Magazine and Golden Books and his impeccably composed posters for the National Park. So he was designing um, in the 50s and 60s in America, um, creating, these are all paintings of mostly animals. And these here are examples of birds. Oops, let me click to the next one. And then here's some examples of, here's a family of a possum. Here you have a, what is that? A praying man mantis, I think, the bug. Um, and then you have a rooster with a caterpillar. Just kind of showing you that not only is he going into complete abstraction and simplification, of of these animals and then bringing in pattern and really creating this these as very uh, modernist styled stylized illustrations all right and here's where we're going to stop for for this section of of uh, simplification in graphic design history